Casi entero el siglo XX, Almost el Cáucaso funcionó políticamente en tres estados, Turquía, Imperio Ruso, sucedido Turkey, por los países socialistas soviéticos, y Persia luego de venir en República de Persia. With the Islamic Republic of Iran. But after the dissolution of the USSR, the exclusion of new nations came into place that have been dismembered from the peripheral of the USSR. And this, of course, changed the political map of the region, with Russia to the north, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia in the center, and Turkey and Iran south. The multi ethnicity and pluriculturality is one of the characteristics that goes through everything happening in the Caucasian region, and this is the reason, due to many of the conflicts that take place in the 20th century, because there are more players, and this creates more complexities. So this is what geopolitically an energy matrix means between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, the one of them in the one of the greatest hydrocarbon fields of the world. So what are the alliances, projects and interests here? What's the volatility at the region and what threat security? Russia as the great power. Is it the balsam? What worries the NATO? What helps China and the new Silk Road? Does everyone want peace? The two implications of this today in critical moves. The board has been displayed, and let's take a look at the actors and the events. The first move is about regional security. Last week, military managers of Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia created agreements on military cooperation to safeguard their territory integration and joint project as a oil transportation system and others. The manager of the state of Turkey, Jasar Gul General, said, we need to ensure stability of our projects and bring everything we can to our positions in order to reinforce peace at the region. Recently, the troops of these three countries previously mentioned developed military exercises. The Secretary of Defense of Azerbaijan, General Sakir Haranov, provided a statement about this when they signed the agreement. The objective of this drills and maneuvers was to ensure energy. The ministers of the exterior and foreign affairs work in this three-way meeting in Istanbul in October to ensure the continuity of the strategic association. These meetings with three countries have taken place since 2014. Let's add some more information and continue. We believe that the route between the Central Asian countries and the Caucasian could be really important. Georgia, with better models in this region and the world, can become the hub for logistics and transit in the region. Obviously, we will get a benefit with this, and we will generate economic activities. Let's hope that the route brings more trade and mobility for the people. It's the interest of the people in Europe and China, and it helps all the countries that are part of this route. At the beginning, we ask ourselves some questions, and we're clearing our doubts. But first, let's take a look at the map with the geographic location and the characteristics of this zone in order to place ourselves in the most comprehensive way possible. The Caucasus comes from Caucasus, the Greek word. It's one of the pillars that holds the world, a natural region of 12,000 kilometers bound by the longitudinal line dividing Eastern Europe and Western Asia between the Black and Caspian Seas. In the south of the Caucasus, there are three countries since the disintegration of the USSR. Georgia, with fights in two independent regions, Armenia and Azerbaijan, that have Nagorno-Karabakh as part of their wars. This is part of the Near East. And then the Russian Federation divided in seven republics, Chechenia, with two wars and still has fights in Gusetia, Dagestan, Karachay, Sarkesia, Adigea, and North Ossetia. In total, the population adds up to 30 million people. Its long history creates a wide difference of ethnicities, religions, 
languages and languages. There are over 60 different ethnicities, over 100 languages and dialects. The Muslim religion is the most important one. There's a Christian minority as well as Jewish enclaves and a mix of Christianity and paganism. Economically, they are based by oil and natural gas due to the vast natural resources of the region. The Caucasus Mountains, a beautiful place known as the Russian Alps between the Cuban and Turk River basins to the north with the Anatolia River and the Iran River to the south. Its geography is a continuation of the Himalayas. Questions that add up to the formula that now we want to solve in critical modes. Let's stay back and take a look at them. Russia is the great power. What's the worries for Europe and the NATO? What helps China and their ambition of the silk road? Does everyone want peace? Let's answer these questions and wait for our invitees to interact. The Deutsche Welle. Calls the new Silk Road, China going through the Caucasus. The new Silk Road through the Caucasus with the mega project of the Silk Road. China is building over all traditions. A strategic in play in the plan is Georgia, according to Emil Draxorik from the capital. The group that has the greatest inversion to Lisi and the biggest mall of the Caucasus, an adventure park and apartment buildings. China is also building in different cities of the Caucasus. Strategically, it is important to create a port in the city of Pati on the Black Sea. In the future, bigger vessels that need a deep water vessel could set sale there. Part of the interest of the Chinese country over a different actor, the Russian Federation. Let's take a look at Sputnik now. Russia defines Armenia as a key partner in the South Caucasus. Regarding the 25th anniversary of the Armenian army, which was commemorated in January last year, the Vice Minister of Russia of Defense, Ros Gonsalikov, while meeting with his counterpart of Armenia, Vigan Saxian, said, this is an organization able to counterattack the threats of the region and ensure a great level of defense capacity. There are different levels of conflicts due to ethnicities and religions. We see a great ally in the South Caucasus. This is a quote because it was mentioned by the representative of defense of Russia that attended this act for the 25 years of the Armenian army. And now a recommendation for today is to read this on Hispan TV, the balkanization of Russia. All the roads lead to Moscow. This is extremely interesting because it answers a different question. Felix Antonio Cosillo, professor and philosopher of Colombia, is the author of this. After the USSR and the new states, the NATO went through almost all the former Soviet republics and through all this area surrounding and threatening Russia with a direct military attack and then with a possible division of the country in Chechenia, Gusetia, Dagestan, Ossetia, Balkaria, Russian republics that have Sunni Islam as their official religion, is the place where American intelligence services, as well as British and Israeli, together with the NATO, try to create a new state. The Emirate of the Caucasus, they call it. The Balkanization of Russia would start there with this territory in the periphery in order to continue dismembering the country and the borders, trying to create a similar strategy to the one found in Syria, attacking Russia through the southwest with foreign mercenaries and radical tactics, trying to reach the independence of the Caucasus Emirate. Other countries will also be accomplices to this because the states also want to see Russia divided into pieces, as well as getting an important ally in Central Asia, living Syria and Iran without their main ally. This was written by Felix Antonio Cosio Romero, professor and philosopher of Colombia. So we have this piece of information as a possible solution to one of the different hypotheses that we said before, or one of the questions that we were asking at the beginning of the program. It's a difficult scenario, many different aspects to consider. And now, let's speak with our correspondent in Turkey, Aitor Chavarri. Hello, Aitor. It's a pleasure to have you today in Critical Moves. It's the first time that we talk to you. 
Good afternoon, everyone in Telesur. On November 21st, people from Serbia and Turkey and Georgia signed a cooperation for military integration for the different projects that these three countries are carrying forward. They specifically spoke about the pipeline of Baku Tbilisi Fejar and the railroad project of Baku Tbilisi Har. Azerbaijan is the greatest ally of Turkey in the region, and relationships with Georgia are very good as of today. Turkey is one of the main commercial partners of Georgia and one of the main investors for the economy of Georgia. From the Turkish government, they insist on the importance of this type of projects as well as the importance of keeping security in projects as such in order to bring positions between the different countries and create peace and stability regionally and globally. There are a lot of people as of today who already call this commercial agreement this trade route as the new Silk Road from Turkey, Istanbul, Aitor Shabarri, Tvesur. Well, here we have a map of the relationship provided by Aitor Shabarri. So, Russia is the promoter of this in the region. What are the roles that Iran and Turkey hold here? What are the interests of China, Europe, and even the NATO? This was our recommendation, as we mentioned before. A commercial break, and we'll be right back to interact with our analysts and answer more of the questions. Stay where you are. We'll be right back with Recall Moves. The Caucasus, the economic implications of this today in critical moves. Let's take a look at Sputnik. The news agency published IMF foresees a stop in the growth of the economic movements in Central Asia. And this is what the perspectives provide that were shown on November 6, point that the growth in the region of the Caucasus and Central Asia was beyond the expectation of 2017 because the region grew 1.4%, and in 2016 the growth was only 2.5%. But it's expected that for 2016, this eagerness will lower up to only 4 percentual points. The Caucasus has always been an area of conflicts due to historical differences of ethnicities and religions. While the USSR ensured the bonding of all the federated territories, but after it was dismembered, a lot of foes created mainly in the periphery, for example, Georgia, that since its independence in 1991 has seen coups secessions, wars with Russia. It's a border area with a lot of ethnicities that was a stop with the rest of the empires, the Ottoman, the Persian, and the Russian. Let's take a look at some data and then we will continue with our analysts. Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, located in the Caucasian region, in the eastern border between Europe and Asia. In the 90s, had different war episodes, and 25 years later, relationships are frozen with some wars every now and then. The development of the Caspian Sea as a reservoir for oil and natural gas brought this fireball to the board that the state nations of the Caucasus are the gateway of the hydrocarbons of the region and the Caspian Sea and the Soviet architecture continues there, makes products to have to go by. Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia are transit territories to European markets. Georgia, the former USSR member, most unstable in the last decade due to civil wars that it had faced in different areas, got its independence on April 1991 while the USSR was dismembering. 
In the web of this, there were two autonomous republics near to it, the South Ossetia Republic and Abkhazia Republic. The former had already shown its intention of dependence in the 80s. Another friction point is nagorno karabakh that in the moment when the USSR was being stopped, they had a certain possibility of having a possibility of having its own independence, but they wanted to adhere to Armenia. The fight between 1992 and 1994 between Armenia and Georgia was a total war, and today it's a frozen conflict between both republics. But there are mixed feelings today that block any possibility of peace. An important role is played by new actors that became important in this geography since the reordering of this area, Russia, Turkey, and Iran, bordering with some of the Caucasian countries important in the region and with no desire of the stabilized region. Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey tried to be the breaking point to stop the unbalance of powers in the Caucasus. So, from San Sebastián, we have Iñaki Gil de San Vicente, a Basque intellectual. This is a very difficult event due to all the stakeholders here, and also because this geography is located far away from the place that we are located. Welcome and thank you. Let me ask you, what's the geostrategic importance of this diverse region that has so much history and culture? Well, the geostrategic importance that it has is the third front, or maybe the first one that imperialism managed by the states could have for a policy of depression to the Eurasian axis of Russia and China. And at the same time, it's the breaking point to increase pressures against Iran. A part of this front is, of course, related to Poland, Romania, Moldavia, Hungary, and others, in hands of the far right, just like Poland. And also Ukraine right now. This is the conflict that is happening today in that country, all the tension with the NATO that takes place in the country. Now, the two strategic place that before the first World War was already acknowledged in the 19th century, the British Empire and the Soviet Empire had a fight around Afghanistan, but it was about all the area. And this is the second big side because of what we've said before, the great wealth that they have, as well as the valleys and the possibility of pressure in Russia and China. Then the other front, the front of Korea, North Korea and Japan. These are the three geographic zones, but there's another argument to this. The area that goes from China to Turkey is one of the core points of the Silk Route. And this has been always until the turn of the West to the Atlantic. So the Silk Route as of today is settling and progressing. So this is not only about the policy of the People's Republic of China just some years from now. The first time took place in 2007 when Georgia, Turkey and Azerbaijan created a mutual route, a mutual connection in 2007. 11 years ago, and here's the project, and it's very significant, the project was boycotted by the United States and by Europe in 2007. Then it had ups and downs, but never forgot about this. And after this boycott in 2007, the project that seemed to be only economic showed, and now it's clear, that had long and deep strategies with a view for many years already created. So the West was not willing in 2007, 11 years ago, when Obama was still in power. The brutality of this was not provided by Trump, and Obama 
wasn't even here. Obama came in 2008. So that's why they didn't want to bring this to this area, to this area that has now become more cohesive. And we can see the historical scope of this of what the country has. Interesting, Iñaki, at the beginning we were saying that this is a very volatile zone. As of today, there are some contained wars. How do you see the stability of the region? Is it handling by a threat? The stability of the region is handled by two threats, actually. First, the one of the perspective of the big powers of the axis of goods, Russia, China, Iran, Syria, once it becomes stabilized, and the powers of evil of the United States, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and others. So on the one hand, it depends on this threat, because there are some of the powers that could take the balance and lean it towards one of the sides, and they use these terms the axis of good and the axis of evil just to go against the ones that were used by Bush back then in order to divide the world between the good and the evil. But then there's another threat, which is socioeconomic development, the crisis that they are facing right now and doesn't seem to be solved. Apparently, it's going to worsen and there's no light of hope. So putting this two parts together, the powers that care for peace, first and foremost, are Russia, China, Iran, and others, and the ones who want to have a war on creating tensions are the powers that are going back. The United States, Great Britain with the Brexit, and Israel that cannot fight Syria and Palestine, Saudi Arabia that is run on the inside. So what options do they have? It's difficult to create conventional regional wars. They could attempt to do so, but apparently it's too late because they let the process go for the policy and the Eurasian strategy to settle. But they have another perspective, which is also divided into the main and the secondary one. The main one that we mentioned before, when we saw the imminent defeat of terrorism in Syria, was taking all this terrorism to the Caucasus, to the south of China, and it's apparently what's happening. This on the one hand, Turkey already faced there's a strikes just like Iran and there's a strategic attempt of balkanizing all this area but then there's another possibility of creating chaos and the possibility of creating chaos this is just a secondary hypothesis would be for Armenia that's just in the middle it's a Christian region and as of now there's a strategy of breaking Christianism, Orthodox Christianity and the Christianism in Armenia, as in the case of Ukraine, with money and American dollars, they have broken the unity of the Orthodox Islamic Church. This is subject to a deep analysis that we don't have to do today, but we also see how Latin America in North America, Protestant churches are participating in the authoritarian counter-revolution. So it would not be weird if they tried to pressure Armenia to little by little. This would be, of course, the secondary hypothesis. The main one, most likely one, would be to create balkanization wars as World War I and others. And second, take terrorism that has been defeated in Syria and take it towards the Caucasus to the Muslim areas of China and even to Muslim areas as Albania and other regions. Iñaki, to understand this further, you mentioned that stability depends amongst other things, as you said, beyond the capacity of penetration of these powers of evil as the United States and the capacity of infiltrating terrorist groups in order to balkanize and destabilize the rest of the countries. Also depend the resolution of the socioeconomic crisis that you mentioned does not seem to be 
going to be solved quickly. Is this related to hydrocarbons? No, this is not a hydrocarbon crisis. As of now, there is a debate on this. When we speak about debate, we speak about intelligence. When we speak about intelligence, we need to speak specifically about the left wing. We are all red-blooded and have the heart on the left. So intelligence is always related to the left. There are small sectors of institutionality of America that for the crisis of 1930 and right now have reactivated the thesis of secular stocking. And this is related to the global capitalism economy related to this crisis. If the cycles are going to be reproduced or not, this is not only about oil. The problem with oil depends on two causes. First, running out of resources. And secondly, the political and military use of oil in the economic war that has been declared, and also the global rate of benefits. So, based on this perspective, the current crisis is related to contradictions that are beyond the oil. Oil is nothing but a trade. It's important, and it's part of the irrational capitalist markets that can be manipulated by different interests. And then there are other interests in order to set order about this matter by trying to get out of the current crisis that had been drugged in 2007 and maybe before. This will not come from the problem of the resolution of oil only. It will require a deeper change of economic structures and most likely of deepening the conflicts worldwide. So in this area, in this geostrategic area, the policy decided to be applied by Russia, Iran, China and others will be decisive because it would either be like Trump wants to burn oil to make the market grow or to have otherwise what these powers want to do, like Russia, which be using water and collaborating. And I would like to speak about an example. Years ago, the relation between Georgia and Russia were broken due to a war, and for two years Russia is holding a systematic effort to get an approach with Georgia. Immediately, Europe and the NATO tried to boycott it by offering Georgia a military base in Georgia. According to the data, Georgia is going to reject this proposal of the NATO, and they're thinking about having an approach to Russia. These are indicative data, as well as the Pact of the Caspian Sea that is now including the globality of this two-way pact between Georgia, Turkey, and Azerbaijan, and also likely what's happening in the Black Sea between Crimea and these powers. Iñaki, to draw a conclusion on this perspective that you mentioned, speaking about the bigger stakeholders as Russia, the ones with more muscle, the ones that surround the smaller countries in the central zone of the Caucasus, the Russian Federation, is it a bomb or the one that creates local conflicts? I think that as of now, the Russian Federation will only try to boost social and local conflicts that are absolutely necessary to keep the borders up. I think that the Russian strategy will be about this. It's not an attacking strategy, but a defensive strategy. What happened in the Black Sea about Ukraine and Crimea has been a defensive strategy, absolutely legal within current laws from the Russian Federation, and according to how the conflicts are developed and based on the policy of balkanization and terrorism developed by imperialism in the Caucasus, then Russia will apply within a defense policy, will apply those measures that they consider necessary to bring to objectives. First, safeguarding a glasses or a protection territory 
this is a historic law in the World War, but this would also be together with economic and social relationships. And back, I would like to speak about what's happening with the Caspian Sea, where Russia has granted certain things. For example, Georgia, where Russia is trying to reach an agreement. This would mean that Russian diplomacy, this first part, will try to reach a defense policy with a policy of socioeconomic agreements that will tackle this defense policy. For example, selling S-400 missiles to Turkey, India, and negotiations with Iran. The military input between Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia that, of course, Russia is behind all of this will precisely follow this line of events. Iñaki Hilsim Sente is an honor having you here, and thank you for your information and your time. Thank you. Now, after listening to our guests, let's continue with the next guest and the next analyst. What are the strategic projects that are currently being developed between many of the countries that are part of the Caucasus? This is now on the table. We're going to have a break and we'll be back. Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia have been able to put together alliances, strategic projects they want to defend. That's why they have military cooperation alliances for security, as we mentioned in the first segment. Let's bring some more information to projects that are essentially strategic in order to continue to speak about the Caucasus and its implications in the geopolitical scene. For matters related to energy, the Bakuk Tbilisi Sihiran pipeline, known as BTC, is a geopolitical and economic project that goes from Astari Shirat on the in the Caspian Sea until the Mediterranean Sea, connected to Kul. Tbilisi and Sihian, a port in the southeast coast of the Mediterranean Turkey, is the second biggest pipeline after the Dusra. The first time oil was pumped from Baku was in 2005, reaching Sihian on 2006 with a half-life of 50 years and a great capacity. It's the only pipeline that brings oil from the Caspian with it going through Russia and until its construction had the monopoly of hydrocarbons coming from Central Asia, the greatest resource of all in the region are in Kazakhstan. In Kazakhstan, Kivnis, Karasharanatangan, and in the front of the coast, Shirat and Gunashi are located, collectively known as a in the Caspian Sea. The BTC defense in Turkey is related to a process of reassuring this in the region that started in 1998 with the signature of a joint statement of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, and Azerbaijan supporting the pipeline. And what transcendental project of this access is the Bakut Tbilisi Railroad, which was opened in 2017, October, where the capitals, Azerbaijan and Georgia, Baku, Tbilisi, as well as cars in Turkey. The BTK of 846 kilometers, out of which 504 are in Azerbaijan, 263 in Georgia, and 79 in Turkey, is an option to the Trans Siberian territory that goes from Russia to the Baltic. Through the BTK, they will be able to transport up to 70 million of products a year until 2034 and it's part of the Silk Road and will be used by China, Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkey, and other European countries because it will allow the transportation from China to Europe in only eight days. Now, we bring a member of the Communist Party, Gabriel. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you for being here and for coming to our call. Gabriel, this is a very complex matter. And Professor Iñaki Gil de San Vicente spoke about this saying. The number of actors that are today involved in the board that make this more complex, and how far is this geography for us? But now, there are enough elements to understand the geostrategic importance of this. So we heard about the railroad, the pipeline, two projects that allow us and to understand what's at dispute and what's at stake in the region. 
Thank you once again for the invitation. This is extremely interesting. The Caucasus that should be analyzed from a benchmark will allow us to determine which are the economic interests in this region of the world by understanding that every military alliance and every political alliance previously has an alliance in the economic and commercial areas. And this is what's happening in the Caucasus specifically. This approach between Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Turkey is related to this, to keep certain economic interests in this region, specifically by understanding that in the fight internationally between imperialism, there is a need of controlling not only trade routes, but also new markets and workforces. And this is what's at stake here. We need to review the role of other actors, as the Nyaki said, specifically China and Russia. China is a country that has important economic investment in this region of the world. It's the third commercial partner in the case of Georgia and in the case of Azerbaijan, there's over 50 trade agreements. So this commercial relationship between China and this country shows how important this commercial corridor will be that has been called historically the Silk Road. And this will, of course, go through the Caucasus, of course, and historically, a kilo was of silk was the same price as a kilo of gold. And it's the need of China to take its products that are taken to Europe by maritime way and now have land as a possibility for trade and the approach between China and Turkey. Turkey is the core of the world for trade because it connects the Middle East, Asia, and Europe, but also it connects Africa. So based on this matter, Turkey here has a very, very important perspective. And here there are two interests. First, the interest of the empire of the United States and the European Union, and on the other hand, the interest of the emerging powers, in this case, Russia and China. Okay, let's divide these two blocks. First, the interest of the European Union the States. Well, the EU have interest in controlling this route because there's an important hydrocarbon pass, specifically oil produced in Azerbaijan, where there are important transnational companies that are exporting this oil. And to make this cheaper, they need to control this corridor in order to be able to take these products to different places in Europe and avoid cases of the ones happening in France where gas is becoming more expensive that leads to protests and mobilizations. But then there's a second interest that comes from the United States and Europe, and it's to position militarily and it's on different military bases and different military bodies in the region as ways to continue not only by fencing Russia and China, but also Korea. And as Iñaki said, there are three fronts open. They are areas that in the international board of chess for military positioning for these two powers of the empire, in this case Europe, understand Europe as a block of the European Union and the United States to become positioned in this region. And what happens with the NATO? Do they hold the same interest with the States? Of course, of course. Of course, the NATO is the military answer that the imperialism finds in order to organize their military agenda in the world and legitimate and justify the terrorist actions. I'm speaking about the broader states of terrorism and by understanding that all the actions of the NATO in the different places of the world have led and promoted wars against different countries, sacrifice for the people, dead, ceases against countries fighting for self-determination. And based on this, the NATO answers to the interest of corporations of the United States and Europe. And in this case, what's the role of Russia? We asked in Yaquil de San Vicente, is it a bomb? or it's a booster for the conflict, a promoter for local conflicts. Iñaki answered, and now what's your perspective on this? Will they have to put together policies of defense to protect their security 
and independence, but also applying policies of consensus, alliances, and reaching agreements in this part. We need to understand that Russia has historically been a country during the Soviet Union that had a control of this region, and their action and influence over the rest of the countries is absolutely determinant because the objective of the state is to fence Russia. We could not, of course, think that Russia is trying to promote local fights because this is what the Americans have done. If not, we can take a look at Syria and Ukraine, how have they had such fascism in Ukraine to be able to military get there and justify their threat into these countries. The role of Russia as the power of this region of the world needs to show, first of all, strength, military strength, political strength and economic strength. And they should never have the same role of Russia with the role of the United States and other European powers for the development of other conflicts in other parts of the world. What happened in 2008 in the fight between Georgia and Russia for South Ossetia and Abkhazia is the best demonstration of this. When Russia feels the need of having strong steps in order to defend their borders and their vital area of political and economic influence in the region, this will happen. We are certain about this. But thinking that Russia is a promoter of local conflict is not correct. This is what the media from the empire do. What the economy in the region due to the different wars that have taken place during the last five years. This corridor of the Caucasus could have strengthened the position of two powers, of two blocks in the world. On the one hand, Russia and China. On the other hand, United States and Europe. The volatility of this region has always been present in the map. After the dismembering of the Soviet Union, governments have settled dirt often supported by the United States, and we need to identify the role that Georgia has played historically here, and specifically the support that they got in 2008 in the conflict against Russia in 2005, and that has been kept. However, the role of development of trade relationships of China with Georgia has made this country too return and set back with their position. This is undoubtedly a hot spot in the world. It's a strategic trade route, so it's an area where powers could develop a conflict at a large scale. And there's also the Caspian Sea, which is an energy matrix that is located in this vast reservoir of hydrocarbons, natural gas and oil. Yes, of course. Today in the world, there is a big debate about the need of hydrocarbons, specifically oil. Some analysts say that today oil is not a need for the great powers of capitalism, and there is nothing as untrue as this. Oil is a still a fundamental reason due to which imperialism in North America and Europe develop wars in order to control these resources. When Europe and the States feel that this region of the world and that the oil concentrated there, this is also a very interesting region to analyze because it has more than oil. There are also other resources that are necessary for the development of capitalism. The need of buying these resources could be at stake. Then, at this, mo at this moment, they will promote local conflicts, they will put military bases and develop new threats, new sanctions. This is the policy implemented by imperialism in the United States and Europe because different countries of the world that have a strategic resources for them and they need. What other resources? You said that's not only about oil and natural gas. Are there others 
that help for this workforce, yes, labor, new markets, of course. For example, Georgia is a country that has a free trade agreement with China specifically. So they are markets where imperialism needs to set their products as well. So facing this trade war, where both and China are the ones providing the necessary products to the countries in the region, then American imperialism in Europe needs this. They're young markets, so they could be easier to penetrate, of course. Under the context of development of the capitalist crisis of overproduction, Europe and the United States need to find a way to sell their products, and this is a great market because it's close, and specifically due to the cost from the perspective of the route going through a land route, not a maritime one. This lowers the cost in the price of merchandise, and we need to understand that it generates its uh, cost for future conflicts. The same thing happens in the Middle East, where these powers that Iñaki mentioned, the ones of the axis of evil, so the United States, countries of the European Union could exacerbate certain religious ethnic differences in the region in order to balkanize and fragment, of course, divide and win. This is what we often said in this program. This is what they have done in the Middle East. They have done this in the Middle East, trying to create religious conflicts between the different interpretations of Islam. And from this point, tell the world that what's happening in the Middle East and the development of conflicts in the Middle East is a consequence of religious differences. And not saying that what's happening in the Middle East is part of the imperialist plan where this group of mercenaries that are today in Syria and that are losing a war but are still there in Italy, specifically in the border region of Syria, where they are trying to mobilize these to other nearby countries of the region in order to further these conflicts of ethnicities and religions based on the political positions and of interpretation and worldviews. And from this, exploit and increase and exacerbate conflicts that could finally justify a military intervention and after this, absolute control on these countries. Latin America, the Caribbean, could they have any interest in this region of the world? I think that they could. Undoubtedly, there's a great potential here in terms of resources, markets. Today, the relationship that Venezuela holds with Turkey could be a fundamental step to go towards this direction. We need to understand, and I said since the beginning of the interview, the interest of capitalist markets. The relation between capitalist state determined that it's going to be the action of workers so that the alliance between capitalist state would be true alliances between the peoples and relationships between capitalist states that will finally weaken the capacity of workers in their organization for self-determination defense. If this alliance is helpful so that the states and Europe don't continue with the war and they can preserve peace in this region, then it would be useful for the scenario of world geopolitics and then we need to accompany and defend them only if it's for this. But we should never forget that alliances are commercial between capitalist states and then there is a need for organized workers, for popular labor markets in order for this to continue and become more transcendental. We should never see this as the same thing on the UCR in different commercial alliances where the countries that were part of the Soviet Union, cooperated economically, and there was a relation of reciprocity. They are not trying to head in that direction, but we need to assess how this contributes to keep the peace in the region. And to keep this clear and set this as conclusion, the Caucasus, another front of the United States to this member to divide Eurasia or to attack and block important countries as Russia, China, Turkey, and Iran, 
It seems to be the case. Apparently the Caucasus is going to be a new front. And this is not a current discussion. It's been there a while. Especially with the countries around this region and the oil reservoirs there. The oil fields together with the trade route and you add new markets to this equation, then you could be able to understand it's going to be a front of action where American imperialism and European imperialism will try to develop and promote conflicts so that they will be able to dismember the disintegrated territory and thus have a military involvement of the NATO, Europe and their states. Something else about the European Union. They will consider different conflicts to see whether they are to take the balance to one of these countries or to go away due to their relationship with Russia, even though there is a position of different measures and the different perspectives on this. We always assess the European Union as a bloc. It's a homogeneous bloc because within the European Union there are different stakeholders who also have different interests. You should assess and Europe, the main countries are France and Germany. But you also need to understand other powers that are leaving the European Union as Great Britain that have been hegemonic powers previously that also develop different levels of trade agreements and cooperation only with Russia, but also with China, Turkey. Now, it would seem that in last years, the conflicts, the position of the European Union has been served out to the interests of their states. So this is dangerous because undoubtedly it will not allow us to make a difference between this force, which is mainly a war force that develops and widens war throughout the world, which is the states, against what the European Union means. They seem to be commercial, economic, military and political partners that work for the same objective. So we need to take a look at this little by little and understand that in the region of the Caucasus, we should be careful with this, what you said, because these are not the same countries of the European Union. This is clear. Thank you very much for being here, Gabriela Aguirre, our guest. So let's continue with our conclusions now. When we speak about the Caucasus, we also speak about small countries that have problems between them and that have been 25 years and their three powers with historical economic interests as well as for security. So what happens within the boards of the Caucasus has important geoeconomic implications on the thousands and thousands of kilometers nearby. It's an important front of imperialism for a policy of fencing the Eurasian axis, Russia, China, Turkey, and it's a point to increase the pressure against Iran and now Turkey itself. In order to stop the Silk Road that will go through the Caucasus, Russia will have to create a policy of defense with one of creation of agreements and alliances, as said by one of our guests. The stability of the region will depend on different networks and the will of Russia and Turkey, the capacity of penetration of the U.S. and European countries that want to have localized wars with the infiltration of terrorist groups in order to balkanize as they do in other parts of the world, as the Middle East. And also the stability will be dependent on the resolution of the socioeconomic crisis that seems to be unstoppable today. Many things ahead of us. We need to hope that the rest care for peace. This is the end of critical moves about the Caucasus and its economic relations. Thank you for being with us and continue watching Telesur. We'll be back with critical moves the next time. Thank you.